Thank you, William, and uh, thank you, Crypto Graffiti, for sponsoring my wardrobe today. Um, you guys should check him out on Twitter. He, he does great work. And um, then we'll take a break. Sorry. We'll take a break. Uh, so my name is Ryan Selkis. I'm an entrepreneur in residence at Consensus. Uh, I'm excited to announce my new project, Masari, today, and we're going to have a little follow-up chat with William. Uh, Masari is an open source data library for the universe of crypto assets. And what I think it will turn into is our version of the SEC's Edgar database, but one that's more organic uh, in terms of its sourcing and uh, really takes on the self-regulatory function that I think many of us would agree is needed today in the industry. Before I go into the details about what exactly we're doing, I want to talk a little bit about why it's important and, and why the optics of what a lot of uh, what's going on in the industry is important to regulators at a global scale and in particular at the SEC. And I'll start by actually picking on three of the organizations that I think are doing a really good job with transparency and, and trying to do things the right way and have a very long-term orientation. Um, so the first that I'll pick on is, is Olaf from Polychain. I think probably the most well-respected, most successful crypto fund uh, in the industry really created the category. He was talking on Slack over the summer about a small stake of 0x tokens that they had sold because of the price run-up. And he was explaining that they had a fiduciary obligation to take some chips off the table. Um, he was transparent. Other professional investors are less so. Uh, if you look at Ripple, it's the fourth largest asset in the industry. And I'm not sure if anyone in this room appreciates that they sell 25 basis points of daily volume of XRP every single day. It's an informal policy. It's not listed anywhere because to do so would actually put them in some legal jeopardy and actually give the appearance that they were selling securities. But that's $300,000 a day. That's 1.5% inflation. You'd like to know if that's set in stone. And then the last one is, is Civic. I think Vinny and his team did a terrific job and had one of the most well-aligned uh, token sales of last year, but how many people in this room know or appreciate that in July next year, 11% of their fully diluted money supply is going to hit the market? Now, we don't know if they're going to sell that. We don't know if they're going to lock it up and unwind it over a period of time. There's no transparency into that process. And when you take the very best projects and you kind of see these dynamics, I think you can start to understand that from the SEC's perspective or a regulator's perspective, you've got these quasi-fiduciaries selling quasi-securities that vest over quasi-vesting schedules. We don't call them vesting schedules. We don't call them securities, and we don't call them, well, maybe we call them fiduciaries, but that's about it. And in fact, uh, just a few weeks ago, Chairman Clayton could not have been any clearer that you know, while some of these projects may be going through legal hoops to pass the Howey test, most of them are going to fail the duck test uh, because he himself has said that most tokens, most ICOs, have a significant number of hallmarks of a security. And I think that we should probably take the SEC chairman at his word. Um, the good news is in that same uh, uh, set of remarks that he made, he opened the door for us. And he said, uh, along with you know, penny stocks and a few other areas that the SEC was looking at, can we mitigate or eliminate wrongdoing through better transparency and other measures? So you know, can we basically avoid enforcement actions and get to the same end result? And that's really what we're trying to promote with Masari. So we're creating this open data library that we hope listing platforms and investors and lawyers and other advisors and the projects themselves will contribute to and then be able to access. Uh, and we're going to do so in a way that's completely neutral. So we'll work with standards bodies on a global scale, and we're working with some right now. Um, but all we want to do is host and maintain this open, verifiable registry of high-level information about token projects. Oh, too many. Um, this is always going to be free. It's always going to be open source. There's no Trojan horse here. There's no bait and switch. We're all in on creating this open data library and, and, and being radically cooperative with other stakeholders in the ecosystem. There's probably 30 different you know, Bloombergs of crypto that are booting up right now and trying to position themselves as kind of the go-to information services business. And we're saying, we'll work with all of you. We'll work with the academics. We'll work with you. We'll work with anyone that wants to contribute to this very important project because it's ultimately going to be good for the entire industry. And we view this as, an, as, as our way of helping the industry help itself. Of course, we have some ideas for ways that we can create businesses off of that in the future. But the core Masari database, the core uh, concept of crowdsourcing the equivalents of S1s and 10Ks and financial disclosures when insiders are selling, and, and all the things that the SEC exists in the first place to help protect consumers for, 
um, we want to be able to, to do a better job of that. And so, of course, we're going to be working closely, uh, I hope, with the SEC and regulators on a global scale to actually meet our goals and objectives. Um, we're going to talk a lot about this, I think, in the uh, in the Q and A. But uh, but but William and I have been talking about uh, some of these projects. He did a phenomenal job uh, with with the project called Token Filings that is going to be throwing its support uh, for Masari. Uh, behind Masari, rather, uh, along with the ICO Governance Foundation, which is here. It's a standards body uh, that has collaborated with us on a five-point disclosure document for, for tokens. Um, and then last but not least, uh, Consensus, uh, where we're working with several of the internal projects uh, as part of the Brooklyn project that was announced last week. It's a, a new self-regulatory effort to promote best practices and, and tap the brakes on some of the excesses, I think, in the token economy. So groups like Balance, uh, which is a real-time smart contract accounting software, Frontier, which is a crowdsource research effort, and, and a couple of others internal to consensus uh, are all going to be among the initial partners, along with uh, dozens of others that have actually started iterating with us on, on our one-page disclosure document. I encourage everybody to check that out. It's going to be masari.io. We just released it uh, along with our GitHub today. So we look forward to public comments now so we can lock this down and really have a good base that we can build from. Um, but the one thing that I do want to point out is that unlike uh, some other efforts, we've actually taken a different approach, and the approach matters greatly uh, in, in terms of whether this will be successful. We could have gone to Filecoin and Blockstack and Cosmos and kind of a few other high-level projects that have already done a phenomenal job with their token filings and, and, and disclosures as is. But instead, we've decided to focus on non-controversial objective, quantifiable, you know, relatively static and, and easy to verify, and, and most importantly, um, uh, accessible and, and actionable data points that we can get from the universe of projects. So things like uh, what are the websites, what are the native uh, social media accounts, what are the smart uh, contract addresses, and then of course, what are the supply curves and secondary sales policies look like for all the major projects so that we have a very good base on which to build for the long term. I'm looking Great. forward to talking a little bit more with, with uh, William now. Have a seat. Thanks, Ryan. So in essence, what you've described is a, a form of self-regulation and self-discipline. And you've been thinking and planning up this for a while. What, made you, what makes you realize that this is going to work versus the other approach, which is the SEC might say, it's going to be done this way? Well, one, I think most sane people would say that we're in a pretty wildly speculative bubble. Um, and and I don't really anticipate, nor do I think most people are anticipating, uh, the SEC coming in while that's continuing to go up and to the right. And, and really, it's only going to be when people start to get hurt that they come in. Um, so I see the window for us to self-regulate and get some of this infrastructure in place as pretty tight, right? We don't know when the market's going to correct, but when it does, if it happens tomorrow, maybe it's too late. If it happens six months from now, my hope is that the industry will have coalesced around some very common sense disclosure policies and common, self, uh, common sense self-regulations to actually you know, promote transparency and help the cream rise to the top in the industry. This isn't just about weeding out bad actors, right? It's about uh, coming to the objective truth of what's going on in the industry so that that can inform best practices uh, for the universe of tokens. Yes. Not just at ICO, but, but when we think about secondary sales as well. There's no doubt that transparency is very important, and that's something that the SEC is going to care about. And doing what you're doing is very is not easy. As you said, I, I had an attempt at doing that back in June, July with token filings, and even with companies that I knew very well, and I would ask them, can you fill this out? They didn't have half of the information. It's all over the place. It's difficult to find, and some of it is missing. So how will you uh, make sure that the information is complete and is coming to, to this place? Yeah, so, so we're taking a multi-prong approach. So, so it really comes down to two things. So one is I think we've come up with a way to uh, attack this from multiple angles. So one is just to get all of the stakeholders around the projects themselves. Uh, to support Masari, first and foremost, right? And say, yes, these this starting point makes sense. We want to support the Masari project. We understand what the initial disclosure asks are, and they seem reasonable and not time consuming, right? Um, if we can get as if we can get 80% of the information that we want from the non-projects, 
like for just from the other stakeholders, the other funds and, and researchers that are already compiling, uh, compiling a lot of this. Like MIT has a new lab that, that they're forming around token economics, and they've done research on a 1,000 of these different ICOs. Right? We're going to be able to work with them and, and pull some of that data. Once we have 80% completion, it makes it easier for us to go to the projects and say, hey, correct any mistakes that we have and, and actually work with us to clean this up. That's, that, that was kind of our original thesis when, I, when we started talking about this you know, uh, just eight, eight weeks ago. Um, the second really important thing is now the SEC has come in through their remarks and I think generated a much greater sense of urgency. So there's definitely an element of timing for why we're so confident this is going to work. So what will be the first deliverables? I think you mentioned working with the IGF, the ICO Governance Foundation, and they've already initiated a form IGF-1, which is a good uh, start. But you mentioned the paper, and I have a preview of it here, and it's divided in many different parts, like uh, cap table, custody chains, um, financial reporting on uh, specific uh, lockup periods, governance and amendments. I mean, this is very serious. So uh, can you talk a bit more about what, what will be the first thing we'll see uh, that's kind of tangible? And when? Yeah, I, I think uh, certainly by the end of Q1, we'd like to have um, where are the white papers, where do kind of key disclosures live, what are the verified websites, token sale sites, social media accounts, just to prevent scam and, and kind of phishing attempts. So that's kind of one side of what we'd consider low-hanging fruit. And then the other side, um, which might take a little bit longer, but is, is very, very important, is um, what does real inflation look like for all these different projects? You know, I mentioned Civic. There's dozens of projects right now that have 10, 20, 30 percent inflation that's going to hit next year. And they're is that already good or bad? Because I know inflation is a really I think that's going to be very bad. Related to the economy. Especially if liquidity, you know, if if if, if some of the uh, exchange platforms start getting more serious about applying Howey more rigu uh, rigorously uh, and delist tokens, liquidity for many of these is going to dry up. At the same time, you see much more dilution. But what, why is inflation bad if it's uh, reasonable, if whatever the number I is? I don't think reasonable inflation is bad. No, not at all. Um, but the issue is uh, when, it, if, if it's gradual inflation, that's one thing. If you've got projects that have cliffs, where after a year, 15% becomes liquid, whether it's from the investors or the advisors or the corporate coffers or whatever. Um, I think people will probably want to know what the policies are for unwinding that, right? Are there policies? Is there a board governing that? Does, you know, what, what, what does that whole process look like? Um, because otherwise, it's very difficult. And this is where I think the SEC would come in. Or, or regulators like them and say, well, all the insiders and all the investors know like what the secondary sales policies are going to be, but all these consumers that are buying up tokens have no idea what's going to depress the price or, or potentially you know, be, be a boon for the price if, if they're planning on locking some of this up. Okay, so the best place to go to get educated is to go on the website, and you have a lot of material that you've published from now on? Uh, Masari.io. Okay. Right now, we just have the, the landing page up because this project's so new. Um, we actually just came up with our logo uh, yesterday. That was courtesy of 99design. So that, like, that's how fast things are going. We'll probably do a, like a more intensive branding process. But I was pretty happy with this. Um, but uh, so right now, it's just uh, linked to Twitter, linked to, uh, link to, to GitHub, and then um, an email list. So we'll, we'll be able to update people. So last question, what do you expect uh, from the market? How, what kind of help do you need uh, and do you like to, to have asking the audience here and whoever is uh, listening to? I think the most important thing for the 1.0, kind of going back to your point about token filings and, and some of the bootstrapping challenges, um, we want to get feedback on this disclosure doc um, because it, it is, it looks robust, but we think it should only take uh, like an hour, hour and a half to complete because most of the questions that we're asking have binary answers or it's where does this live on the web, not give us this, this, and this in this certain format. Right? There's a few components like that, but but understanding um, kind of what is going into the thinking behind this one pager and making that as tight and non-controversial as possible. Like that's the most important thing that we're focused on. That's it's, gotta be, it's gotta be so obvious and, and the data that we're collecting at least initially is low standalone value, very material, but, but non-controversial because it lives somewhere, right? Either Slack channels or Telegram groups or blog posts or you know, in, the, in the old white paper. Yes, that would be a good thing. I'm fully supportive of this, we need it. So with that in mind, uh, it's 10.10. As uh, I promised, we're staying on time. 
We're going to come back at 10.30, so this is a short break. And uh, thanks. Thank you. Thanks.